All right, so let's, let's pause for a second and, and shift sort of to your politics before we go into some other stuff. Because from the, the critics of yours, they, they, she's a right-wing maniac and she's a right, hardcore right-wing blah, blah, blah. Now, people are saying that about me too. And, and I oh, find- Oh, you wrong yeah. right-wing crazy you. Yeah, and it becomes, it means nothing. It just means that you're right. not a complete leftist, whatever. So they right. just say you're a, you're a right-wing whatever. Um, we chatted for just a second before we started. And basically you said you're, you're socially liberal and what, what, what's thought of as right with you is just that you care about national security. Is that pretty much? Yeah, I'm a 9-11 national security conservative. Um, you know, the New York Times did an interview with me uh, for my second book titled, They Must Be Stopped. And, you know, I mentioned in it that I voted for Al Gore. And a lot of my friends were like, <laughs> you voted for Al Gore? I said, yeah, I'm a 9-11 conservative. 9-11 uh, made people realize that we are fighting for the survival of our civilization. We are dealing with people that want to kill us. The national security issue is an American issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue issue it's not a libertarian issue it's an American issue America has been attacked under different administration by radical Islam regardless of the politics of whoever was living at the White House America was attacked the first time under the Carter administration in 1979 a Democrat mm -hmm. with the hostages in Iran America was attacked again under Ronald Reagan administration a Republican in 1983 with the blowing up of the Marines in Lebanon yep. America was attacked under George Bush senior administration America was attacked under the Clinton administration. The first bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993 was under President Clinton, a Democrat. Yeah. It was actually under President Clinton that the Taliban trained 10,000 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Now, these people were not being trained for entertainment. They were trained to attack the United States of America. America was attacked under George Bush Jr. administration, a Republican, on 9-11. The only difference between the attacks of 1993 and 2001 is the buildings didn't come down. And then people thought if we just elect President Obama, all our sins are going to be forgiven. The whole world is going to sing Kumbaya. Yeah. Obviously, that did not happen. So do you, do you think that's his biggest failure, that when he gave that Cairo speech, and it was sort of the reset of this whole thing, that... He, he sort of offered an apology for America's foreign policy and whatever else, and that it bought us no goodwill. It didn't do anything. And actually, and then you can argue about the red line in Syria and a whole bunch of other things, that when we're quote unquote nicer, even though he was at war every day of his presidency in Afghanistan and drone strikes in Pakistan and all that stuff, that the, the niceties just don't fly in reality. No, because it's not about niceties. We are dealing with an enemy bent on our destruction because of their ideology. And as a matter of fact, President Obama was work, he did not understand the Middle East um, or was complicit working with the Muslim Brotherhood because he Actually, thought we'll, they, we'll they, they are a, a moderate organization. Actually, the person that wrote President Obama's speech, which he delivered in Cairo, the first major speech to the Arabic world, was written by the head of ISNA, the president of ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, which is an unindicted co-conspirator in the largest terrorism trial ever in the history of the United States. In 19, um, uh, in 2007, 2008, which took place in Dallas, Texas, the Holy Land yep. Foundation versus our government government mm -hmm. or our government versus the Holy Land Foundation. So this happened immediately before he came into office and he started working with the Muslim Brotherhood. He actually forced President Mubarak, who was our ally, because we got the majority of our intelligence out of Egypt and Jordan other than Israel. Mm -hmm. And he literally threw Mubarak under the bus and forced Mubarak to accept having the Muslim Brotherhood leadership in the first two rows uh, attending his speech in Cairo yeah. to the chagrin of Mubarak because he wasn't understanding what was going on. And he basically empowered them to basically become so belligerent um, and advance their cause. So do you think Mubarak saw the writing on the wall then that he was on his way out oh, no matter absolutely. what? You think he absolutely. knew it? Absolutely. Because it wasn't, Tahrir Square was a couple of years later, but at that point, Obama basically said he has to step down. Then they, Obama, demo, then they democratically elected the Muslim Brotherhood, and then it was worse for a year, and now they have sort of another version of Mubarak. In Obama season. undermined Mubarak, and Mubarak knew it, because Mubarak knew how close Obama was working with the Muslim Brotherhood. And 
Mubarak knew that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. You know, they are classified in Egypt as a terrorist organization. They assassinated- Somehow they're verified on Twitter. I don't know if you know, they've got the blue check, the Muslim Brotherhood on Twitter. They're a terrorist organization in Egypt, but- Yeah, but not here. Yeah. You know, they assassinated President Sadat, who mm -hmm. signed the peace treaty for Israel, and killed him because he signed the peace treaty with Israel. Yeah. That's how Mubarak came to power. And Mubarak had his thumb on them. So Obama thought, oh, Mubarak is a dictator. He's got his thumb down on these wonderful people who are just trying, you know, to express their opinion. Um, America did not understand the Middle East. So Mubarak knew what was coming and Obama emboldened them. Yeah, okay, so let's pause on the Muslim Brotherhood stuff because you've given an incredible speech about that that has about a million views and it's, I would highly recommend that everyone watch it. We'll link to that as well. Uh, but the, the Egypt one is an interesting one to me because it shows sort of the, the crappy situation we found ourselves in. That Mubarak, even though I can see you, you support him in certain ways, he obviously wasn't a great guy and was doing a lot of things against no. the, the press and he, he was running, right. he was ruling via the military, but then they got worse. It was worse for the democratically elected year of the Muslim Brotherhood. So what, what then is a sensible solution? You know what I mean? If, if the choices are between military and then a democratically elected group that's gonna be worse than the military, what is a sensible option for a country like Egypt that is, you know, really right in the thick of this thing? Well, the answer lies back 40 years. And what happened in the Middle East in the 60s, that's when we, and 70s, that's when we started seeing uh, the Muslim Brotherhood strengthen. And remember, the Shah of Iran, Iran was a very liberal society. Afghanistan was a very liberal society. It's incredible Egypt seeing the pictures of women from right. back then at universities that were dressed like Westerners. Absolutely, yeah. like Westerners. Egypt was a liberal society. Syria was a liberal society. Now, Iraq was a liberal society. So when you look at these so-called, what we call dictators, who had their thumb, like the Shah in Iran, having his thumb down on the Khomeini followers, um, the Shah knew that these are the radical Islamists who want to establish the Islamic Caliphate. They want to resurrect the Caliphate. They do not want to have anything to do with westernization. They want to oppress women. They want to put women in shadours. They want men to grow beards. They were the radical ones. So you have people like the Shah or Hafiz al-Assad before Bashar, now the son. Yeah. Remember, Hafiz al-Assad, the father, killed 30,000 of them in Hama. Uh, in Syria in the 70s, 30,000 Muslim Brotherhood radical Islamists trying to rise in Syria. Sadat did the same thing to them in Egypt. The Shah tried to do the same thing to them in Iran. So they were rising all over the Middle East wanting to establish the Caliphate, wanting to bring back what we have today in Iran under Khomeini or under ISIS right now, uh, what they're doing or what Hezbollah is doing in Lebanon with the radicalization. And we did not understand what these liberal leaders, we thought of them as dictators, but they had to be what they had to be in trying to thumb, put their thumb down on the radicals. Right, it's funny you describe them as liberal, but in, in that sense they were liberal. Maybe not by our Western standards, but right. they were, there right. was some movement there at right. least. Yeah. Right, but if you talk to anybody in the Middle East, Back then, whether it was Sadat, Sadat signed the peace treaty with Israel. Yeah. King Hussein signed the peace treaty with Israel. Now, it takes a liberal leader to be able to think, I do not want to have anything to do with that radicalism. I want to reach out and sign a peace treaty. And now look how the deterioration of the situation, whether in Jordan, look, King Abdullah has 2% support. Yeah. That's it. Um, how, how much of them, without getting too far into the, to the Israel part of this, because that could take us another 27 days, um, how much did they just sort of need the hatred of Israel? So like the two most stable states in the Middle East are Jordan and Egypt. It's not a coincidence that they have peace treaties, but how much do these countries just need the idea of a conflict and then perpetuate it? So for example, in Jordan, you know, they say there's anywhere from 40 to 70% of the Jordanians are actually Palestinians who don't have equal rights. Or in Lebanon, aren't there something like 40 or so jobs that Palestinians aren't allowed to have and they have trouble getting citizenship and all that? Like they need this conflict to, to uh, keep the eye off what their own governments are doing. They don't need the conflict. They can get the jobs they want, they can grow, they can accomplish, except I can tell you about Lebanon, my own experience. In Lebanon, in the, in the refugee camps, in the Palestinian refugee camps, when- I don't mean the Palestinians in the refugee camps need the conflict, I mean the governments need it because they have to keep everyone focused on Israel instead of dealing with what's well, going on Well, they hate Israel in the Middle East. They yeah. do not want Israel in the Middle East, but you have to understand the Middle East is majority Muslim. And the Jews are classified in the Quran as Nejis. 
Yeah. The word najis in Arabic means filth. Filth is dogs. That's why Muslims hate dogs. They think it's najis. Bodily fluid, uh, feces, that's najis. The Prophet Muhammad on his deathbed, on his deathbed, his last statement, commanding the Muslims to fight the Jews and kill them until the day of judgment. That's Prophet Muhammad's last commandment because he was poisoned by a Jewish woman three years earlier. So in the Muslim mind, the Jews will are eternal enemies. They do not belong in the Middle East because they are soiling Arab land. That's why they want them out. So Israel could, could withdraw out of all of Israel and leave only Metula, just a sliver. <laughs> the Arabs will not be happy with that. They're gonna go after Metula, trying to kill every last Jew. Yeah. That's the problem. It's not about geography, it's about ideology. And that's the problem that people in the West don't understand. Okay, so speaking of ideology, so now we, we've mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood a bit. As I said, you gave this incredible speech about it. For people that don't really understand what it is at all, can you sort of do Muslim Brotherhood 101 and what this ideology that's really spreading across the world right now is, is up to? Ah, well, the Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest uh, Islamic terrorist organization in the world. It was founded in 1928 in Egypt uh, by a group of mullahs. Uh, and that was, and today the Muslim Brotherhood has 70 offshoot Islamic organizations, including Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and also ISIS. Uh, you know, Al-Zawahiri, who is now the head of uh, Al-Qaeda, was in prison and exiled from Egypt as a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS right now, was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in our prisons as early as 2011 mm -hmm. uh, because he was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood, its members are the most highly educated members. They are the lawyers. They are, Al-Zawahiri is a surgeon. Al-Baghdadi is a PhD, has a PhD in Islamic the theology. Uh, Osama bin Laden was a, a, a businessman engineer. Os uh, Muhammad Atta, the ringleader of the September 11th attack, was an engineer. So the Muslim Brotherhood was founded- but I thought this was about poverty. That's what people on the left will always say, it's about poverty, if they has, just had the same opportunity. It has nothing to do with poverty, it has to do with ideology. Uh, this is why you see people like Osama bin Laden leaving all their wealth, all their millions, and going living in a cave in Afghanistan. This is why you see al-Zawahiri, a surgeon, living in a hellhole in Afghanistan. This is why you see people like Muhammad Atta or Ziad Jarrah, the second, uh, the, ring lead, the second in command of the 9-11 attack, blow themselves up. He was a doctor. It has nothing to do with money. See, we in the West think if you have the swimming pool, hmm. the Mercedes, the nice big house, and the nice zip code, why would you want to kill yourself? Because we are judging everything according to Western values. But the Muslim Brotherhood was a response to the ending of the Caliphate by Ataturk in 1924 in Turkey, when President Ataturk gave rights to women to vote, gave rights to women to in education, gave rights to women to choose whatever they want to do, whoever they want to marry. So the Muslim Brotherhood was launched. And when it was launched, people thought, oh, Islam is over, Islam will never be resurrected. So the Muslim Brotherhood kept growing and growing and growing and organizing. And two things happened in the Middle East that made the Islam explode worldwide. The discovery of oil in the Middle East and then Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power in 1979. That gave them the money and the spiritual covering to explode on the world stage. In 1982, the Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan, a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on earth. Yeah, and this is what your videos about that I've been mentioning. In the, in the counter-terrorism circles, the plan became known as the project. And what makes the project so unique is it gives tactics and proposals as to how to use our open-mindedness against us, how to use our multicultural against us. They even talk about certain words that will make Westerners lay down their guard. Words like uh, diversity, uh, tolerance, multiculturalism, interfaith. Um, does that sound familiar? Um, they <laughs> right now, I mean, the word Islamophobia, which is a completely nonsensical idea. No one's afraid of the, of the word, uh, you know, Islam as an ideology. You're afraid of what the adherents might do. Oh, right, yeah. right, exactly. And by the way, Islamophobia was concocted at the United yeah, uh, Nations by a group of Muslim organizations saying, well, we need to vilify anybody who's going to talk about Islam or criticize uh, Islam. Well, we in the West debate. I mean, people like us who come from the Judeo Christian world, the Bible says, come, let's reason together. Right. In Judaism, they have uh, people that go to seminary, all they do all day long is debate. That's yeah. their job. And I don't let's and, debate. And that being said, I don't think that anything that we're doing here is based in any sort of biblical or anything. You're you're, you're, no. giving me, you're giving me secular 
thoughts on historical secular, events. Uh, absolutely, exactly. Uh, you know, but so the Muslim Brotherhood started exploding, and they started in this plan talking about how to get democratically Muslim uh, elected to the West on all levels of the West, uh, how to get uh, Muslim interns and governmental offices so they can have an insider view as to how policy is done on the highest levels. They talk about how to work with like-minded organizations, progressive organizations that share similar goals. This is why when you see the ACLU working with CARE, mm -hmm. you scratch your head and you think to yourself, how can these two people work together? You've got a radical lefty organization, you know, pro-gay, pro-abortion, pro-this, pro-that. You've got the Islamist, on the other hand. But the ACLU is being used as the useful idiots at the yeah. hands of people like CARE.